And the title of, of my, my message today is God's House. We're it. We're God's house. Did you know that? We are the Amen. temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we need the Shekinah glory of God registering within us. That's the Old Testament name for the Holy Spirit. So let's let's read Psalm 84. Okay. Alrighty. Psalm 84. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord, and my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is on the pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be the doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a son and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in your ways. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name and we ask, O Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would fall upon us, that you would convict us, that you would anoint us, that you would hold us up, that you would encourage us, that you would empower us to be the people of God that you intended us to be. And we thank you that we are not alone. You said, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And we know this for a fact. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to share with you the prayers of some men that were very important to the United States of America. Eight different presidents. And so bear with me as I share with you, this is a book called The Praying with the Presidents. Did you know that our early presidents prayed for us? Amen. Okay, let, check this out. This is so cool. I couldn't hold this, uh, keep this from you for any longer. God bless you. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's the disadvantage of being outside. Okay. Now, this is, our, this is the father of America. This is George Washington. You've probably heard a lot of negative things about George Washington. He's not, he was not a perfect man. Okay? He did own slaves. Okay? Cannot deny that. But he was definitely a man who wanted to bring freedom to all people eventually. You got See, our problem is we judge those people by 21st century standards. Okay? You got to understand something. Slavery was everywhere in the world. And oh, by the way, America did not invent slavery in 1619. That's what we're, our kids are being taught now. That America invented slavery. Well, you need to go back to the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Egyptian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the, Bibles. the Bible itself. Every the, s Slavery was not invented by the United States of America. It was invented by Satan. Our founding fathers said things like this, that all men are created equal and that they are given certain inalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They weren't perfect. They did have slaves, but they put in our documents the very seeds that would lead to the Civil War. And by the way, the political party that gets blamed for slavery all the time is actually the party that liberated the slaves through the leadership of the very first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln. Okay? So all this nonsense that you're being told, these, these people that are pulling down monuments and saying that America's evil, that America was you know, built on the backs of, of the Indians and the slaves. Yeah, there was some, America has done some bad things. 
But America has done a lot of good for the world. And I can prove it. At the end of World War II, we were the only country that had the nuclear bomb. And what did we do with it? Did we conquer the rest of the world like the Romans would have? Or like the Egyptians? Or like the British? Or the French? Or the Germans? Or the Russians? No, we didn't, did we? We created the United Nations, which now is the biggest pain in our side ever, okay? But that's what happens when, you, when you're the good guy. You, you, you try to do what's right, and so, unfortunately, because all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, sometimes your good deeds get used against you. But you know what? That doesn't give you an excuse to start doing bad deeds, okay? Social justice is not justice. It's just out and out vengeance. And if you don't believe me, the leader of these groups that are crying for social justice, you know what he said? He said he will burn this country to the ground if they don't get what they want. That's not the way it works in America. We vote. That's how we get what we want. If you want to change America, you need to vote. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get off on a political tirade, but, but I just wanted to, I wanted to share with you the faith of our founding fathers, beginning with George Washington. Listen to this, this, um, this prayer. He says, I beseech thee, my sins remove them from thy presence as far as the east is from the west, and accept for me the merits of thy son, Jesus Christ, that when I come into my, uh, thy temple and encompass thine altar, my prayers may come before thee as incense, and thou would hear me calling upon you in my prayers. So give me grace to hear you calling on me in your word, that it may be wisdom, righteousness, reconciliation and peace to the saving of the soul in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ grant that it may hear it with reverence receive it with meekness mingle it with faith that it may accomplish unto me gracious God the good work for which you have sent it Amen. that was George Washington asking God to forgive him of his sins and to use him for good to for good works and boy did God ever Amen. John Adams, he has a little bit of a shorter prayer. Don't worry, no, they're not all that long, okay? <laughs> this is, he says, I pray, heaven, to bestow the best of blessings upon this house and all that should hereafter inhabit it. May not but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof. That was a dedication of the White House. He was praying for future presidents to be godly and to be good. And we haven't always hit that mark, have we? The next president, Thomas Jefferson. Did Thomas Jefferson own slaves? Yes, he did. Own slaves. But did you know he tried to free his slaves? And you know what the authority said to him? Because we tried to do that when we were still a British colony. They said, it's against the law for you to free your slaves. And it was British law, not American law. The American colonies wanted to get rid of slavery, but the British crown said, nope, you're part of the British Empire. There's slavery all over in the British Empire. So you can't do that. That's an illegitimate law. And that was one of the seeds that caused our founding fathers to decide that they were going to break away from the British crown. Amen. Okay? But again, Jefferson was not perfect. Nobody is. The only perfect human being was Jesus. Okay? And this is what he prayed. He says, Endow your spirit of wisdom on those whom you're in your name we entrust the authority of government that there may be justice and peace at home and that through obedience to your laws we may show forth your praise among the nations of the earth. Notice the call for peace and praise. Okay? James Madison. See, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just reading the prayers of the very first six presidents and then I'm going to hit a couple of modern day presidents. Um, this is what James Madison prayed or said he said we have all been encouraged to feel the guardianship and the guidance of that almighty being whose power regulates the destiny of nations yeah. and you understand something he wasn't talking about gods in general he was talking about the God of the Bible the almighty Amen. he was calling for God's guidance hang there with me we're almost there this is what James Monroe, he's the guy that made the Monroe Doctrine. He's the one that told the European nations, stop taking territory in the New World. Stop interfering with America. Stop interfering with South America. This is what he says. For these blessings we owe to Almighty God, from which we derive them, and with profound reverence, our most grateful and unceasing acknowledgments. He was saying he was giving praise and credit to God. 
recognizing that it was God that blessed America, not, not you know, a king or, a, or even a president. This is what John Quincy Adams said. I speak as a man of the world to men of the world, and I say to you, search the scriptures. The Bible is the book of all others to be read at all ages and in all conditions of human life. These men built this country on God's word and on the God of the Bible. Don't listen to the revisionists. They're going to try to tell you that the, the Constitution is an atheist or agnostic doc. It is not. There were 56 men who signed the Constitution. 39 of them were biblical ministers, biblically trained ministers of God. 39 of them. The, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution is completely and totally built off of God's Word. And now to finish up with the praying presidents, I want to I want to share with you Dwight D. Eisenhower, who sat in the presidency in one of the most prosperous times in America. In the 1950s, that was that was called the, the baby boom started in the 50s, and in America, 85 percent of all Americans attended church on a regular basis. And there was financial prosperity like never before seen in America's history. And this is what Dwight D. Eisenhower said in his inaugural address. It says, Before all else, we seek, seek upon our common labor as a nation the blessings of Almighty God and the hopes in our hearts fashion the deepest prayers for our whole people. May we pursue right without self-righteousness. May we pursue unity without conformity. May we grow in strength without pride itself. May we in our dealings with all the peoples of the earth ever speak the truth and serve justice. And then finally, the last president I want to read after is, is my favorite president, Ronald Reagan. And this is what he said in, an, in the annual National Prayer Breakfast on February 4th, 1982. He says, I've always believed that we were, each of us, put here for a reason. That there is a plan somehow, a divine plan for all of us. I know that whatever days are left to me belong to him. I also believe this blessed land was set apart in a very special way. A country created by men and women who came here not in search of gold, but in search of God, that they would be free people living under the faith, under the law with faith in their maker and their future. Sometimes it seems we've strayed from that noble beginning, from our conviction that the standards of right and wrong do exist and must be lived up to. God, the source of our knowledge, has been expelled from the classroom. We turn away from him too often in our day-to-day -day living. I wonder if he isn't waiting for us to wake up. I can report with some ab absolute conviction that that prayer was answered in the 1980s because there was a spiritual revival going on where our nation came back to traditional values, came back to the Word of God. In fact, I was part of a denomination that was the fastest growing denomination in the world and we saw in our church the hand of God move in a powerful way and it was awesome. And you know what? That hand can move today and even more so. Because I believe as we hurl headlong in history, we're getting closer and closer to that day when Jesus Christ is going to come back. And the devil knows that. And he is upping his game. We need to up our game. We need to understand that we have a pilgrimage. First of all, we need to understand that our home is not on this planet. This planet is not your home. Bob was telling me he, you know, he bought a boat and a trailer and, you know, but you know what, Bob? That's not your eternal blessings. That's just a blessing here and now. And I'm not against, you know, blessings on earth. I want to be blessed. Who doesn't want to be blessed? But our blessings, our greatest blessings, is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our relationships with our, our husbands and wives. Our relationships with our children. Our relationships with our fellow Christians as we assemble together in unity, in love, 
and faith in justice. Let me tell you something. I understand why there are people out there crying for justice. I know that some of this anger has been, has some, a, a, a bit of justification to it, but they're searching for justice in the wrong place. Just like they're searching for love in the wrong place. No country, no person, no thing can ever love you or make you feel loved like God. Amen. Jesus sticks closer than a brother and he has a home for us. And like Ronald Reagan said, he said he felt like he had a destiny. Who knows? Maybe some one of the young people here, maybe your destiny is to be a, the president of the United States of America. Wouldn't that be awesome? Just remember us little people when you get to that beautiful White House, okay? You're saying that can never happen. In America, it can. You know why? Because this country, whether you like it or not, was built on the Word of God. And the Word of God tells us where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. If we want true freedom and liberty and justice, we have to be godly. A Frenchman came and examined America and he wondered why was America so much more prosperous, so much more powerful than his native France. They both had revolutions. They both overthrew a crown, got rid of a king. They both got rid of kings and queens. But France de-evolved into a dictatorship under the bitter rule of Napoleon Bonaparte, which plunged Europe into a war. But America rose and has created a land of the free and home of the brave, has created a pleasant land. Why? Because in Psalm 34, verse 13, it says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I've been told by teachers that these founding fathers, they weren't really Christians. They, you know, I've, I've even heard some Christian preachers, oh, they were deists. They weren't really born again Christians. I look at their prayers and I go, how can you even think that they're deists? How could you ever not realize that they're born again? Well, they had slaves and they did this. Well, what do you do? If I followed you around, would I catch you drinking and getting drunk? Would I catch you having sex out of marriage? Would I catch you swearing at someone and cursing? Would I catch you doing sinful things? Are you perfect? Can you walk on the water and raise the dead? You can in Jesus, but not in yourself. None of us are perfect. And so, you know, I get tired of hearing the argument against leaders that, well, they're not perfect. They did this bad thing, and therefore I'm going to tear them down. Well, you know what? Then we all deserve to be torn down. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. Not only we have a home, and in that home we have a God. And if you're a believer, that's what we need to long for. We need to, as the deer pants for the water, we need to pant for God. You know, in this home, God even has a place for the sparrow. The sparrow, just the dinky little sparrow bird. Because God loves the sparrow. God loves all his creation. Amen. The, the Bible tells us that God feeds the animals in the wild, and he does. He has a, an ecosystem that sometimes we screw up. But it always bounces, you know, and, and it cracks me up. Oh, the world's going to end in 10 years if we don't stop driving around in cars, if we don't stop using air conditioners, if we don't stop doing this. Do you know that they, those people have been saying that since the 70s? When I was a kid in school back in the ancient days of the previous century, okay, I had teachers that told me that by 1990 or the mid-90s, there would be no more oil, no more gas, that, we, that the world would be this one big greenhouse, that we'd all be starving to death, there would not be enough food, there would not be enough shelter, that it, that it would be literally hell on earth. And lo and behold, the 1990s came and went, 21st century came and went, the 21st century is now 20 years old, 
okay? And guess what? We have more energy, more oil, more gas, more food than ever before. And it's not just in the United States. It's all over the whole world. But yet we have forces that want to tell us how bad things are. You know why? Because when you think you're a loser and you have nothing to live for, you can be manipulated. When you are fearful, you can be manipulated. The Bible tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. I am not afraid of the COVID virus. I refuse to live my life in fear of a stupid virus. There was a preacher by the name of Wigglesworth. You know what he used to do? He used to go and he used to ask doctors, find the most virulent disease you have and put it on my wrist and watch it die. Amen. And they did. And it died. You know why? Because it wasn't Smith Wigglesworth's day to die. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. So if I happen to die from the COVID, then I'm supposed to die from the COVID. And I can run and hide and wear masks and, hide and keep myself away from... If God wants me to catch the COVID virus so I can go home, I'm going to catch the COVID virus and go home. But if God doesn't want to call me home, I can go right in the middle of COVID virus and beat that virus to death through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I don't put God to a foolish test. I don't walk out in front of cars because I don't believe that today's my day to die. You know, I'm not gonna, you know, you know, if someone, if I know someone has, they're sick with the COVID virus, I'm not gonna ask them to breathe on me and, you know, rub their arms all over me and, you know, and, you know, take, lick me with their tongue or something. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna put God to a foolish test, but I'm not gonna be afraid of them either. We gotta stop being afraid. Fear is the opposite of faith. And perfect love cast out all fear. You're right, brother. That's a good verse. That's a good verse. We have a home. Um, one of my, my favorite bands, Disciple, one of their early songs, had a, some lyrics that go, we have a God. His name is Jesus. We have a God. He'll never leave us. And of course, the guitars are screaming and the drums are beating and Nelson was a dancing and celebrating Jesus. Because I like lively music. That's my thing. Not only do we have a home where we will live one day and praise God for all eternity, but we have a journey, my friends. We're pilgrims. You're a pilgrim. We're in a pilgrimage. Look at what the psalmist says about, about that. It says in verse, oh, the wind took me away from my passage. There we go. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, speaking of the Lord, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go forth from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord of God, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. You know, what, you know what's being said here? The valley of Baca is the valley of weeping. It's the valley of despairing. And God has called us to pilgrimage into the valley of despair and to call down the blessings of God by preaching the word of God, by loving people, by allowing the Holy Spirit to anoint us with power and authority and his glory so that people see the living God living inside of us. They see the love of Jesus. Jesus said in John 13, 35, he said, and they, speaking of the world, they will know that you are my disciples by the love you have one for another. Guys, our first job is to love one another in this group so much that people are jealous and want to be a part of that love. <laughs> Because every human being wants to be loved. Every human being wants to be accepted. Every human being wants to have the presence of God. Every human being wants to have a purpose. Why do you think we have existential poets? These are people that see there is no purpose to life. They think everything's vain and vanity. 
And, and you know what they call for? They call for the destruction of it all. Because when you don't have hope, you're heading for the valley of Baca. The valley of despair and weeping and destruction. But we, the children of God, are supposed to go into the valley of Baca and present the glory of the Lord and the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel of His, of His word so that they have hope. You know, one of the easiest places for me to minister when I was younger was in the streets of Northampton. You know, because at first they didn't like the fact that Christians were there. We were doing Christian drama. I, I, I was a part of the drama team when I was in Bible college. Love doing drama. Think it's great to be able to do drama and stuff. Pretty much dramatic in my life. Okay. And they were like giving us the finger and swearing at us and telling us to get out of there. And we didn't go. We stayed in the Valley of Baca. We stayed on the streets of despairing. And, and the longer we stayed, then they started getting real with us. And they started asking real questions. They said, where's the church been? Where's the church been? And I had to say, you know what? You make a good point. The church has abandoned you. But God hasn't. And God has sent us, members of, the, of his church, to let you know that we're sorry that we haven't been here before. But we're here now. And we'll pray with you. We'll give you the good news. We'll show you to have hope. And something that happened, something very curious, when I was on the streets of, of Northampton and Westfield, whenever I preached the cross of Jesus Christ, lo and behold, guess what happened? People got saved. Whenever I preached about the rapture of Jesus Christ, lo and behold, people got saved. You know why? Because those two doctrines push people to think about eternity. The cross lets you know that Jesus died for your sins. And that because of your sins, and if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you are going to hell. But if you ask Jesus into your heart, you are redeemed. You have passed from judgment into eternal life. And the rapture reminds you that we're not staying here forever. This is not our permanent home. Our citizenship is not nestled in this earth for now. I am a citizen of the United States, but one day I will be only a citizen of heaven. And that's true of all of us who have Jesus in our hearts. But we need to go into the valley of Baca, into the valley of weeping. And we need to show these people the hope of God. Because without hope, there is no reason to live. You know, depression and suicide is on the rise. America has been plunged into the Valley of Baca by, I feel, by the works of very evil men in high places. The globalists are not your friends. Okay? They are not your friends. They are your enemies. They want to enslave you. They want to put you under a satanic government. They are the precursor to the Antichrist. That's the bad news. I got the good news here. Jesus. The Holy Spirit's still poured out. And until the Holy Spirit's outpouring is removed, that Antichrist satanic government can't come. Until we are raptured out of here, the Antichrist can't be revealed. He's stuck. Wherever he is, whoever he is, or whoever she is, I don't want to be confused, confused, uh, accused of being sexist. Okay, I think he's going to be a guy. They're usually guys in the Bible. But anyways, whoever the person is, okay, can't be revealed, can't take the power. You know why? Because the church is still here in the Valley of Baca, preaching the gospel, sharing the good news, asking the Holy Spirit to fall. You know, I... I've mentioned this before, but I love what Chip and Kathy, they, they pray to God and say, God, show us who to witness to. And God gives them clues, and they go and they witness to that person, and they get saved. Oh, lo and behold, wow. You know, any one of you could all do that. I have a little bit of a different style. I try to stir things up a little bit. You know? Like, for you Red Sox fans, if you were unsaved, I'd walk in with a Yankee jersey just to get you stirred up, just so that we could have a conversation. But if I was hanging out with Yankee fans, I'd wear a Red Sox jersey just to stir you up, to cause some conversation. 
Or maybe I would wear... Eagles. <laughs> oh, I would definitely stir up trouble with those eagles. No. <laughs> but anyways, my point is that we need to be looking for divine appointments. Okay, we need to be purposeful. We need to go into the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping and despair, and look for those that need deliverance by the blood of Jesus Christ from their sins. On our journey, we need to recognize that God is our strength, that we're just pilgrims passing through, that we're going to go through the valley of Baca, and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Right? That, exactly. The, the valley of Baca, or the valley of death, can't touch us. You know? I'm going to date myself. There was a, a semi you know, he was, there was this guy named The Hammer. He used to sing, can't touch this. Can't touch this. And you know what? We can sing that to the devil. The devil can't touch me. The devil can't touch me. And he can't stop me unless God lets him. You know? The devil can't kill me until it's my time to go to heaven. So we can sing, we can tell the devil, can't touch this. But more importantly, we need to remember that we go from strength to strength, from faith to faith. The just shall live from faith to faith. It is faith that gives us strength. It is faith that gives us the victory. It's the, our faith in Jesus Christ. It's our faith in the gifts of the Spirit. It's our faith in the fact that the Holy Spirit wants to, you know, the Bible says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. So what is that inferring? I think we probably quench the Holy Spirit then. And the Bible says, don't do that. Let the Holy Spirit flow. And let me tell you something. If I preach this sermon in some churches, they kick me out. Get out of here, you crazy radical. This Holy we don't want none of that crazy Holy Spirit stuff. I want the crazy Holy Spirit stuff. Because it's the crazy Holy Spirit stuff that brings the supernatural into play. Let me tell you something. Unless the Lord builds the house, the labors labor in vain. It's not your job to build the house of God. It's your job to be the house of God and allow the Holy Spirit to flow so that others can be built into the house of God. It's only as we submit to the anointing of the Holy Spirit that we can live up to loving one another as Christ has loved us. Because let's face it, sometimes we can't even like one another, never mind love each other. I'm being real here. You catch me on a wrong day, and I can snap your head off quicker than, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'll feel bad about it. <laughs> I'll ask God to forgive me, and I'll ask you to forgive me. Because honestly, in my heart of hearts, I don't like it when Christians are fighting. To me, that is the most grievous thing that can ever happen. Is when Christians fight with one another because it's because it's going directly opposite of what Jesus said they will know that you're my disciples by your love that you have one for another and our greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart mind soul and strength and to love our neighbors we love ourselves we need to love our neighbors more not less they need to see the love of God in us they need to see the love of God demonstrated amongst us because they're not going to believe us if we tell them that God loves them when we're fighting and bickering and, and bashing one another. We need to build one another up. We are the body of Christ. And the church is only as strong as its weakest Christian. But I got some good news for you. You know what Jesus said about the weakest Christian? He said, he said first of all, he said John the Baptist was the greatest person ever born from women. In other words, he was the greatest Old Testament saint of all time. But you know what he said about the weakest Christian? He said, the least in the kingdom of heaven is even greater than he. Why? Because Jesus is in us. We need to let Jesus out. Okay, Jesus is going to love. 
Jesus is going to forgive. Jesus is going to heal. Jesus is going to give us words of wisdom, words of knowledge. Jesus is going to give us healings. Jesus is going to help us speak in tongues. Oh, yeah, speaking in that tongues thing. Oh, boy. <laughs> Pastor's getting crazy. Paul says, I speak in tongues more than you all. Why did he say that if it wasn't important? But yet there are Christians who say that's not an important thing. I'm sorry, I beg to differ. I do think it's an important thing. I'm not going to fight with them over it because the Bible says to avoid foolish arguments. But I'm sorry, the Bible is the final authority. You, you know, I want to be a good Berean. Acts 17, 11. The Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, but searched the scriptures to see that these things are so. I don't expect you to believe me just because I say it. But I do expect you to respectful and listen to what I have to say and then test it to God's word later on. And if, it, and if you find something that's not quite accurate with God's word, come talk to me nicely. Don't rip my head off. I don't like my head being ripped off. Nobody does. Okay. But if you come to me respectfully and lovingly and say, hey, pastor, I, I think maybe this is a little more accurate. You show it to me in the word. I guarantee you I'm on board. 100% of the time. Because I'm not perfect. I don't know everything. I'm still learning. Not only do we have a home and a journey, but we have a shield on this journey. And go, going back to Psalm 84, verse 10 and 11, it says, For in the day, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand wow. elsewhere. Oh, yes, yes. Actually, that's inferred. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. What does the sun do? It gives us light so that we can see what we need to do. What does a shield do? It protects us from our enemies. At the end of Ephesians, we're, it's told that we're to grab a hold of the shield of faith. Not the shield of fear, but the shield of faith so that we can quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. The devil is going to try to hit you with fear, going to try to hit you with envy, going to try to hit you with hatred, going to try to hit you with all kinds of wickedness. And we need to use, we need to be built up in God's word so that we can raise that shield of faith and block every single one of those darts. And if we happen to miss one, then we, I, we need our brother and sister to interlock their shield with our shield, their faith with our faith, so that they can help us block the missiles that we might miss. Oh, and by the way, our armor only works as you move forward. You turn around and run, you are wide open for pew, pew. And I'm sure your guardian angel will knock a lot of it down, but God may let you get, you know, maybe one in the butt just to, <laughs> to wake you up. You know, <laughs> I like that. God is our shield and it says the Lord will give grace and glory no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly don't believe the lie of the devil that God is stingy and wants to take away from you that he wants to give it to everyone else but not to you that is a lie from the pit of hell God is righteous and gracious and he will withhold no good thing from you if you walk uprightly and how do you walk uprightly you have to be in Jesus to walk uprightly you can't you cannot work your way into heaven Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says for by grace we are saved through faith not the result of works it is the gift of God so that no one can boast the only way we can walk uprightly is to allow that grace the grace of God to give us all good things and I want to close with the final verse in this chapter it says O Lord of hosts blessed is the man who trusts in you I have asked you a question do you really believe that yes. do you really believe that if you put your trust in God you will be blessed yes. then why do we complain why do we moan why do we gripe? Why do we look at other people and get envious of what they have? Oh, oh, pastor's talking to that person longer than he's talking to me. I'm ticked. That ain't fair. Oh, and God, why don't you have the pastor talk to me more? Or, man, 
I can't believe Bob's got a beautiful boat. Where's my beautiful boat, God? Why are you withholding the beautiful boat from me? Okay? We need to stop that. Because when one part of the body is blessed, the whole body is blessed. You know what? Guys, Wendy and I have been ministering here, it'll be 15 years. Actually, 15 years today. Today's July 5th. 15 years. It's our anniversary. It's our anniversary. And do you know, it's been awesome loving on you guys and being loved by you. It's been awesome sharing the Word of God with you and being in Bible studies together and doing services together and worshiping together. But you know what the most awesome thing is? On average, we see in this church an average of six people every year accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's the greatest thing. Because that's, that's 90 people that will not go to hell. That will not burn in the fire forever. That's 90 people whom we're going to hang out with in heaven. Yay, and party. And celebrate. And eat the marriage supper. However you want. You know, for those of you younger, we're going to party. For those of you who are more spiritual, we're going to have the marriage supper, the lamb. Whatever. We're going to have a good time with one another. One day, this life is going to be a distant vapor. One day we're going to know that we know that we know that God does not withhold any good things from us. That we are blessed. One day we will sit on thrones. Did you know that? One day we will have crowns. One day we will wear royal robes of righteousness. And we're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. And we're going to be able to look back on this life and all the good things that we did in God's name will be remembered. And all the bad things that we did will be forgiven and forgotten and removed. But the question is, how many good memories are we going to be able to look back on this life? Because you know what? Right now, this is the time to let the Holy Spirit give you a gift. This is the time for you to be used by God to lead someone into the kingdom of heaven. This is the time for you to worship Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. It begins now. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Eternal life doesn't begin in heaven. It begins on the day in which you're born again of God's Spirit. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians never figure that out. You know why? Because they don't implant the Word of God into their hearts. Jesus said, Truly you are my disciples, if my words abide in you, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. I've had the power of the Holy Spirit come on me in the past and be laid out on the floor. And there were some times where I would laugh hysterically and continuously because God was tickling my spiritual funny bone. And sometimes I would fall on the, on the floor and I'd cry because God wanted me to cry for the lost or cry for whatever. There are other times where I would fall under the presence of Almighty God and just, there would just be a sense of peace. But it, it was things like this. It's the supernatural elements of our Christian faith that help us buffer the times when Satan goes, oh, that Christianity thing, it's no different than Islam, it's no different than Hinduism, it's no different than this, it's no different. No, it is completely different. Because the God of the universe lives inside of us and wants to anoint us with his Holy Spirit and fire so that we can go into all the world and live, preach, and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for every single person that's here. Lord, I know that every person has a destiny in your kingdom. Father, I pray that supernatural things would begin to happen in the lives of these believers and in the lives of the believers of this body that are not even here today. Lord God, speak to us. Give us dreams and visions and signs and wonders. Pour your love and your Holy Spirit on us and in us and through us. Lord God, help us to forgive one another as we would forgive ourselves and as you would forgive us. Help us to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Lord God, help us to be the people of God that you want us to be. And Lord, thank Thank you for 244 years of liberty and freedom in the blessed United States of America. 
God bless America. God bless our president. God bless our people. God forgive us for our violence and our wickedness. Lord, give wisdom and prudence and love and power and might to President Trump. Show him how to lead us closer to Jesus. Lord God, there was a prophecy in the 80s that this president would lead us back to Jesus. And that's pretty wild because I wouldn't have expected someone like Trump to do that. But Lord, you, you spoke to one of your prophets. And Lord, I'm just going to believe in faith that you will do this. Because there was another prophecy that said that he would go in whispering the name of Jesus and he would leave the presidency yelling the name of Jesus, preaching the name of Jesus. And I asked that that would happen and that there would be a revival in both the Republican and Democrat Party and that the halls of Congress would once again house a church like it did in the 1800s. And I asked this, and oh, and Lord, I ask for the salvation of 120 million Americans that don't know you right now. Yes. Father God, I pray that you would awaken your church and that each one of us would lead at least one person into the kingdom. And if we all did that, 120 million people would know you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.